Yo, what's up, guys? How y'all doing? Happy Friday. I'm your man. I'm your host, Tim Black, for Team Black. What's up? Oh, man, I hope you had a good week. Nobody got shot. Nobody got evicted. Nothing like that. You know, you ain't walking on your wife sleeping with somebody else or vice versa. Your wife didn't walk in on you. You know how that goes. Living outdoors is never fun. But, hey, I got a great show lined up for you this week. Got my man Freeze Love. He's a comedian, actor, writer. How? Freeze. Freeze, why are you looking at me like that, bro? Thought we was cool, man. He always looked like that, man. He always, you know, like this host, this nigga, this one. Got that look on his face. It's all good, though. That's my man. Now, before I get into the fun stuff me and Freeze talked about, because we did talk about some fun stuff, man, I got to talk about this. This week, you may not have heard it. I mean, if you were in a coma or dead, if you were dead, then you're not hearing me now. If you are, that's some scary shit. Um, you may have missed out on the Walter Scott, the shooting that occurred in South Carolina, unarmed black man gunned down by a white cop who decides he won't bust eight shots in his back. Well, I covered that a couple stories. I did a couple videos. And then some dash cam footage came out from Officer Slager's car. Showing what happened before he decided to bust off them caps. Right? So people are like, Tim, what do you think now? What do you think now? What do you think now? What do you think now, Tim? What do you think now, Mr. Obama? It's like, my name is not Obama. It's Tim Black. But I get your point. All right, so let's look at the clip, and then let's talk about it. Here it is. We've now received the dash cam video uh, from this incident. Uh, this is what happened leading up to the uh, killing of, uh, of, of Walter Scott. Let's watch it. Okay, let's start with your license. The reason for the stop is your third brake lights out. Okay. You don't have any paperwork in the glove box. No registration in there, no insurance. Why is it? Okay. But you're buying this car. Did you already buy it? No, not yet. I'm about to buy it. Okay, it's a minute ago you committed, you bought it. And you're changing everything over on Monday. I'm sorry about that. They want to come back to you and All right, we'll be right back with you. to do a lot. I'm sorry guys, I had to do a lot to stay awake. That clip was born as hell. I mean, up to the part where my man ran. <laughs> he took off, didn't he? He did a Usain Bolt. 
So that's what 50 looks like running. So you guys who are 50, y'all think y'all still got it? You ain't still got it. You see how fast my man, Mr. Scott, was running? Not fast at all. But I bet in his mind, he was gone. In his mind, he was gone. It's okay to laugh a little bit. We're going to get justice for him one way or the other. Now, look, this is the thing, man. For all you racists and bigots, dumbasses, and self-haters, because there's a lot of them, too. Jesse Lee Peterson types. Gerardo Rivera hating black people. There was nothing that justifies shooting this man in the back as he fled. Nothing. Zero. So I'm sorry. My opinion before I saw the video hasn't changed one centimeter since seeing this video. I'm the same man. I feel the same way I felt. I have not changed. You understand? Now the fact that you somehow believe that Human beings should be under the foot of police. And police should be able to do whatever they want to do. Do whatever you want to do to me, boss. Just go ahead and do it. Please go ahead and put your boot up, your boot up my ass if you want. Go ahead and choke me out and kill me. That's because you think that's fair. And you think that's right. Doesn't mean I do. And I had the same opinion whether Mr. Scott was white, Asian, Latino, Swahilian, uh, uh, Filipino, French, I don't care. Muslim, I don't care. Christian, atheist, I do not care. I do not care what Mr. Scott happens to be. He happens to be a black man. He happened to owe some money. He wasn't even out. Listen, listen. he owed child support. You know how people are owed child support who are running from cops? That means we can shoot them all in the back. Come on, man. Look, I don't even want, you know what? If you're too stupid, if you're so stupid and brain damaged that you believe that that officer Slager is justified in what he did, man, I don't even want to talk to you no more. You, you, are, you, are, wasted, you are wasted saliva and oxygen. I should not waste time talking to you. You are beyond reaching. I'm through with you. You're too dumb. Go live under a rock. Go somewhere. Just go. Just go over there. Leave me alone. Go over there. Wait for me. All right. Like I said, I got a great show coming up for you guys, man. It's the Boss 2 Podcast. Thank you for being here. Let's get to that part of the show, man. If I hurt somebody. Damn sellout bastards. It's Friday, folks. Welcome to the Boss 2 Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Black. We got interviews. We got up-to-the-minute news. We got entertainment. We got it all. The Boss 2 Podcast. Team Black. Why can't we pick our own colors? No way, no way. Try the ones that doesn't work. You get four guys, we're all fighting over who's going to be Mr. Black. All right, welcome to the Boss 2 Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Team Black. That's right, Team Black. Team Black it up on Instagram and on Twitter. Use that hashtag, Team Black. All right, now, you ready for the interview with my man Freeze Love, actor, writer, comedian, hire him, hook him up. The man knows his stuff. We talk about empire. We talk about Hollywood influences. We talk about drugs. We talk about, oh, man, c comedy. We talk about joke stealing and joke stealers. We talk about Carlos Men Stealer or Carlos Joke Stealer. We talk... <laughs> <laughs> that ain't even right because my man don't even go in too much. But you know what? You'll hear for yourself about Carlos Messia. Also, we're going to talk about Kevin Hart, Mike Epps, Eric Spears. We even talk about ecology. We talk about a new style of hip-hop that my man Freezes undertaking. And, and yo, we talk about the Baggers Collective which is a comedy tour my man Freezes putting together with my man A.J. Johnson. He's hell! He's hell! From Friday. <laughs> anyway, guys, check out the interview. It's hot. I'm, I'm glad you could take time out your schedule, man. You, I've been wanting to get you on here for a minute, man. I'm a true fan of your work. I, I, you know, and I think you're one of the comedians, man, that I would say, like, man, I'm 40. And you've been in the game so long, man. You, you one of the guys I looked at, man, when I even considered getting into comedy, bro. Much respect and homage to my man Freeze Love. 
Man, thank you so, so much, brother. I mean it. And it's, man. Hey, any, and, and I'll tell anybody, I'm glad you, you got into comedy instead of sitting around wishing you was in comedy. <laughs> you know? No, nah, like Freeze, so freeze I ain't, look, I, Freeze, I'm not in comedy like you, bro. I got, I, I have comedy traces, but I'm not a comedian, bro. Nah, I'm gonna leave but, that to but, you. <laughs> but, but, but let me tell you though, you you are you are in the comedy family because you've taken action with your funny, and oh. that's what it's about. You don't have to always be a comedian. There's a lot of people that are really funny, but they don't do anything. You got to do something. Become a writer. <laughs> Become a radio for anything. If you're funny, you're funny for a reason, man. Yeah, you know, matter of fact, when you brought up writing, I noticed, Freeze, after doing a little research, man, that you you have some writer credits as well as acting credits as well as stand-up credits. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, I mean, if you're going to... One thing about being a stand-up comedian, you got to eat. And paying, you know, being on stage isn't always going to bring in the bread. Right. So you got to diversify, <laughs> you know? <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, I was in the game, I was doing stand-up for about 10 years and was a writer, but didn't realize I was a writer. And then someone pointed out to me, they said, well, you're a stand-up comedian. Of course you're a writer. You write your own material, right? I said, yeah. Right. They said, well, you're a writer. You just have to know how to, how to bring it into light. You know, just for anybody who doesn't know, Freeze, please tell people where you're from, man. Where, where'd you, where were you born and where where'd you originate? I am a West Coast kid, 100% born and raised in Los Angeles, California. West Coast and kid. West Coast, West Side. West Side. <laughs> and um, I lived, when I was, you know, kind of, I had about 10 years under my belt as far as comedy goes, stand up, in Los Angeles, in the Hollywood area, the comedy store, the, the improv, the live factory, the Ha Ha Cafe, all these places in LA. And I had, um, you know, I was bored. I wasn't, it wasn't challenged anymore. It was like, you know, I had to, to see what else comedy had to offer. So after 10 years in the game, I moved to New York. Didn't know anybody in New York. I had one cousin from Chicago that lived in New York. Wow. And I ended up staying with him and a couple of friends, other comedian friends that I knew started and, you know, plugging me with the, with the rooms and the, the whole New York grind. I ended up staying in New York for 12 years. My wife is from New York. I really fell in love with New York, especially for, for comedy. It's just the one place on this earth where comedians are truly looked upon as being professionals. Wow. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. You went to New York, a place you, I'm assuming you hadn't been, by yourself, just drop, drop of a hat, you went to New York to make it happen. I went to New York. I had, um, it was a trip because... I went on a visit. I knew one friend that was that was uh, actually my man Henny Lopes, who is like a, a big brother to Notorious Big and Little C's and all those dudes in the in the Junior Mafia. I met that guy in L.A. and stayed in contact with with uh, Henny Lopes. And just I was always mesmerized by New York. Always always loved the energy. And I've been to New York maybe about six or seven times, but I've always, I always stayed in Manhattan just right in Midtown. Okay. And I was always curious to go to the other boroughs, but, you know, that that's not the, you know, L.A. dude walking, wandering <laughs> around in Brooklyn. I was like, I'm not with that. Right. I'm stay right here in Midtown. <laughs> but I met this dude, and he was he was like, yo, man, if you ever come to New York and need a spot to kick it, let me know. I got people, you know, we'll, we'll hook you up. And on a, on a, I had a, a situation, a crazy situation where I found a diamond ring, man. Wow. And we got on the floor. I found a diamond ring. See what I'm saying? On the floor. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I, I, I cashed it in, took it in. It was worth like 7500 What? I paid off some bills, got right with my child support and all of that. <laughs> I said, you know what? Let me go to New York and see this bad boy. And I went out there. And I'll never forget it. It was I was walking in Harlem at about three o'clock in the morning, coming from hanging out at a comedy club, and a guy in Harlem said, "Hey, man!" I walked past this little jazz club, went to the train, and this guy said, "Hey, man, 
you're Freeze Love. What? I said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, my man, come in here and bless my stage. And he, he gave me $300. Wow. Right there on the spot to right. go do comedy in the jazz club at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I did an hour off the head. And I said, <laughs> that's it. This has never happened to me in L.A. I'm, I got to figure out a way to stay here. That's so what's up. I did. I, 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 you know, made a few ends, you know, put, put twos and fuels together and ended up staying out there. Got in a uh, apartment with my cousin who was from Chicago. Right. And next thing you know, I was. I was on the circuit. I was I was hitting clubs and and it was just it was like a breath of fresh air because right. you know as comedians we feed off of our surroundings. Right. And the thing with Los Angeles was it was I had been there, did that. I was from L.A. I'm, I knew everything about L.A. It's not that I didn't like L.A. I love L.A. Right. But I was burnt out on L.A. as far as comedy goes. Gotcha. So. In order to make it fresh and new for me again, it took me going to New York. And that was, you know, I got, I'm not going to lie, man. I got, I had to work. I had to work. New York is uh, the biggest thing I had to work for is people, they was like, hey, why is this Puerto Rican dude trying to sound like a black man? <laughs> you know? Right. And I'm like, you know, what do you mean Puerto Rican? I ain't no Puerto Rican. What right. You, you know? Right. But I had never been. I'd never been in that situation, you know? Right. So that was you know, something new to play with and and try to figure out. I had to overcome that. I had to, to you know, fight for my right to be in a black man <laughs> with a black voice. So you so, so you had to fight to prove that you were a black man telling black jokes or black... Right. Yeah. Right. And, <laughs> and I've never been in that position before because, you know, in California, right. if you... If you got one eighth blackness, oh, you one hundred percent black in California. They're not playing that. They'll let you know. Right. So I never, you know, and not only me, but other black people knew. They, yeah, freeze is black. Oh, he likes him, but who cares? He's a president. <laughs> I never. I didn't. In New York, there's so many other people. There's that I look like. There's Arabs that I look like. Right. You know, dudes from Morocco that I look like. Dudes from Puerto Rico, uh, from the Dominican Republic, from. All these places, right, and right. these were all people that I had never met. Wow! So you know, I had to embrace that and and figure out where I fit in. You know, bro. Matter of fact, you've done a masterful job at a freeze. I've seen some of your material where you play various characters from different backgrounds, different local nationalities, different races, using that. Well, listen, sometimes you have to do whatever you got to do to get the... If they're going to say you got to be Dominican, then okay, I'm not going to argue. I'm going to get the check. You have to get the money. Some way. Some way. Take, look, take what you got and make it work for you. Take what you got and work with it, man. And I, I'll tell anybody in comedy, if you got a big head, man, talk about that big head. Don't be ashamed. There's somebody else out there with the big head that needs to hear you talking about that. Man, you know? I 100% I agree with you, bro. That's why I've I've started the hashtag Team Black. And people are like, Tim, you're going to alienate white people. I said, see, that's your problem. Y'all worry too much about people being offended. I'm a black man. And I, right. I have no qualms with that. I can't hide it. So why not lead with that? Right. And see, that was the thing with me. A lot of people, especially in Hollywood, they're like, hey, man, look, man, everybody thinks you're Latino. You should change your name to, to uh, something like, like Frio Amore, you know? <laughs> or you should just tell them you're Spanish. Or you should tell them you're Arab. And I'm not. I'm not Latino. I'm not Arab. And to me, that's disrespectful to, to, to try to act like, something you're not to make everyone else comfortable. Oh, man, look, hey, you look, hey, bro, man. hey, Freeze, man, you know you just walked into dangerous water. That remind me of Carlos Mencia, right? Isn't that the thing they were saying about him? Yeah, man. <laughs> because I, I came up in the comedy store with Carlos Mencia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Carlos, I, I believe Carlos is, is half German and half um, Guatemalan. Right. So he is still in the Latino vein. It wasn't like he just, he was a, a Russian that just started trying to act like a Mexican. You know? Right, so you, right. You can't just fault him 100%. You know, he's okay. not, he, 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 he just rolled with what people, 
Zumbi was. And I'm not, again, I'm not knocking anybody. You got to do what you got to do. Right. But I have to do what I have to do. I didn't want to be that guy who was trying to act like I'm Latino because people think I'm Latino. What happens if someone who is Latino comes up and starts speaking that in depth Spanish? Then I'm then I'm caught out there. Then you caught so out there. <laughs> you know, and it's you know I'm I'm proud of who I am. I'm proud of my 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 biracialness, as they call it nowadays. Both my parents, my mama's from Chicago. Her mm -hmm. mother was was white. She was uh Irish, Irish, and her father was African American from Mississippi. My father, his his both of his parents, um, his mother was biracial. And his father was biracial of black and white and black and white. So I come from a long line of black and white people. Gotcha. And when you mix them all up, I guess you get a big Dominican or Puerto Rican or something. But <laughs> you mix you them know, up, you get black. Period. Right. And that's it, man. I'm black. You know, and the thing is, you know, people say, well, you, you are part white. Why don't you ever, you know, <laughs> highlight that? And it's like, really? Because I don't know about the white side. I, I, you know, I, my people... You know, it's it's this whole biracial thing that, that's come out within the last 10 years of people really coming forward and, and claiming both both sides of their 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 family trees is um it's kind of new. You know, I, I come from the era where, hey, if you was a little bit black, you was all the way black. Right. Right. Same you here. Know? Same here. Yeah. There is a there is a uh, lady on Facebook. And I think maybe she'd done some stuff earlier, written for a couple blogs. She made some statements uh, about Kendrick Lamar. I don't know if you heard yeah. about this. She said that uh, Kendrick Lamar recently got engaged to his, I would say, high school, maybe even pre-high school girlfriend. She happens okay. to be very fair-skinned. The, okay. the sister named Rashida, who made the comment on Facebook that's trending, she said, well, you know what? Kendrick Lamar is supposed to be a black conscious rapper. And I don't know. I no longer support him because he's with this light-skinned girl that looks like she's Latino and this and that. So we've been going in on her. I, I can kind of, I'm pissed off about it, frankly, because right. I feel that the brother should be able to date or marry whomever he wants. God put those people together. Mm. Whether they be black, white, whatever, God, if they found love with each other, that was a gift from God for them. Exactly. So don't question it. Don't question it. You don't know what's going to come out of that. You know. So, and and it's so silly. You know. I I mean, people people really this whole the whole racism and the whole light skin, dark skin. That's all right. separate stuff. Right. Stuff to put here to make us separate. And it's ridiculous because we're not separate. I don't care whether you're white, black, Asian, Latino, Arab. I don't care. Everybody wants to be loved. Everybody. 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 You know, so, so let's take that. Let's take that unification that everybody wants to be loved. So if, if everybody wants to be loved, then we're all the same, right? Right, right. That's all I'm saying. I so think, I think this start is... Doing that, Freeze, I think it's a situation where people see an opportunity to get a little limelight. Like, you know, in order yeah. to get her name out there a little bit, she figured, well, love, you know, Kendrick just dropped this single and his album is doing bonkers. So let me jump out here on the man and kind of ride his his coattails to a little bit of notoriety is what I get out yeah. of. You know, yeah, that's like an ambulance chaser, you know. <laughs> that's like that attorney that chases ambulances. <laughs> some kind of a lawsuit or something. It's, you know, people want to make stuff. And hey, I'm, uh, again, I'm not knocking what anger. I'm not knocking nobody's hustle. Right. But I'm just saying, man, don't do something that's going to make you look stupid. Because right now, <laughs> dude, for you to dog Kendrick Lamar, you're looking stupid. Right. Because Kendrick Lamar is an is a artist. He's, he's one of the few artists in his generation that I will say, hey, that dude is an artist. Right. That dude is committed to doing something different. He's committed to being original. And he's committed to the craft of hip hop. Right. How can you knock this dude, man? Uh, that's right exactly now, he, it. He may, he may do something in the, down the line that this 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 worthy of him being knocked. But right now, him dating a light skinned chick, man, get out of here with that, man. Fall back. 
Right. You don't know what, what you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's silly. The That's way silly, the way I look at it, man, it's like he is he's one of the few guys out there, man. It gives me an excuse to be able to still listen to current hip hop. Right. You exactly. Feel me? Exactly. <laughs> I, you know, and I'm telling you, when 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 they first told me about Kim Lamar, I was like, oh man, who is this? He's from LA. Okay, what's he gonna be talking about? I know. Right. Gang bang it. No riding, right. man. Come on, man. That's already been done, man. How you? And then he did it in a. In a he talked about that stuff, but he did it in a whole new light. Whole new way. So I, I got nothing but props for that dude. I mean it, man. He 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 gets in a lot of his lyrics and a lot of his music is the stuff that I'm sure. I'm sure when people, somebody around him when they first heard it was like, man, you gonna do that? Yep. That ain't the norm. That's that not what they work. doing now. Right. And he, he <laughs> didn't do that. He stuck to being the artist he is and brought a lot of people in with him. Exactly. You know, he brought his, the whole ASAP. He shined light on the ASAP gang. Mm -hmm. He brought in my boy, Schoolboy Q. You know, the whole black hippie movement. He brought in some other like-minded people who were about being real, being, being down with the cause of hip-hop, but putting a new spin on it. And that's spin. what hip-hop is to me. And hey, let me tell you, I'm 49. So when you talk about hip-hop, right. you're talking about my music, man. This is the music that I first discovered when I was 12 years old, and it changed my life. When I heard Rapper's Delight, it changed my life. Right. I had never had a song that I had to listen to over and over and over <laughs> and try to say all the words and write down the words right. that were saying. So I can remember no 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 other music it did that for me. None. None. So as far as, you know, when it when it comes time, you know, people say hip hop is over, hip hop is dead. Uh not for me it isn't. It's 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 not gonna end till till I end. Right. It's always gonna be something new. And I'm not saying I'm the end all be all of hip hop. I'm just saying as a listener, as an as a participant, we write the rules, man. We right. write the rules. Right. And it ain't over and it ain't done till we say it's done. Exactly. I'm glad you mentioned hip hop because I got a. I'm in a rap group. I got a rap group. Well, go, go, ahead, go ahead, plug away. Tell me what's up. Man, my rap group is called the Killer Wells. K I L L A H W H A L E Z. And you can check us out online. We got a song on YouTube called "Slap That Seal, Let Your Blow Hole Blow." <laughs> <laughs> see, the killer whale. What? We rap. We rap from the perspective of orcas. <laughs> That's right. We rap from the perspective of orcas, and all of our rap, all of our raps are about sustainability and ecology, and bringing awareness to the ills that humans are placing upon the earth. Wow. You understand? Wow. It says killer whales are the top of the food chain of all mammals. It's their position to speak on it. So that's what we do. Hey, with Freeze, you're, oh, freeze you're not joking. Tea. Freeze, hold up, Freeze. You're not joking with me. You're serious, aren't you? I'm not joking. I'm serious, man. The music is bumping. You can't deny it. You mm. can't deny it. I mean, as an artist, how much, how much stuff are we going to talk about before we're talking about the same thing? One of the things I've always tried to do as an artist is do something that hasn't been done before, number one, right. the original. Right. Number two, be timeless. You can't put a date on it. Right. You, you, it's, it's, it's happening now. It could be happening five years from now. It could be happening 10 years from now. There is no date on it. And number three, blow people's minds, man. Try to, try to do something that, that's going to impact them and make them think. So as an artist, that was that was my goal. I got other MCs together. I mean, dope MCs like my man out of Brooklyn. Big ups to my homeboy Skanks the Rap Martyr with the whole La Casa Nostrin crew, the LCN crew. This is a bona fide, one hundred percent hip hop brother. But he came in and he, he he's also a, a part of Killer Wells. His name is Killer Wells. Is Prince of is uh, Prince of Wales, and he wrote raps from the perspective of an orca. If you're a real writer, you should be able to do that. You know, I noticed on your profile on Twitter um, that you said, it said Echo Hop. Echo Hop. 
Yeah. Eco hop. Yeah, that's, that's the eco hop. That's, 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 that's what it was. Yeah, that's the kind of music we're talking about. Eco hop. All of our music. It's not talking about partying. It's not talking about chasing hoes. It's not talking about shooting people up or moving dope. Right. It's not talking about whips. It's talking about saving the earth. It's talking about the pollution in the ocean. They got to you realize right now, man, they have a a a island of plastic in the middle of the Pacific that is the size of Texas. That's how much waste is in the ocean. Wow. That's how much pollution. And it, that's all from human beings, man. Wow. And the, the reason I'm talking about that kind of stuff is because, you know, I, I got kids, man. Right. And I want my kids' kids to have to have an earth. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's, I want to make it cool to think about the earth, man. That's all. That's real talk. That's real talk. Yeah. And I mean, and you mean that's, that's, that falls in the lines of hip hop. You're supposed to say something. You don't always have to say the the things that everyone's thinking about. Let's try to say something that ain't nobody thinking about and get them to thinking about that as well. So that's what eco hop is. It's all about ecology and sustainability. Hip hop dedicated to sustainability and ecology. Wow. Definitely, guys. Go check out the Killer Whales. Killer, the Killer yeah. Whales. In fact, if you get the video whale. version of this, I'm going to have the link in the description and here on the screen that you can go to that you can check out. Absolutely, man. And it's, it's a, it's fun. And, and again, I'm a comedian, so it is comedic based. It is going to make you chuckle. As long as it makes you smile or chuckle, <laughs> then I'm good. I'm doing my job, baby. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me switch gears for a minute, man, and get your perspective on the empire. Now you being okay. a, you being a successful actor, been in Hollywood for some time, you did Coyote Ugly, you did Baby Boy, you did Dangerous Minds, The Cookout. Uh, I got the hookup. I saw you doing stand-up there. What do you feel about right. Empire, man? Is that cooning, or do you think it's entertainment? Is there room for this? How does it make us look as a community? Well, I think, you know, and mind you, and, and I've only seen one episode of, of Empire. Okay. And it's not because, it's not necessarily because I was turned off or anything like that. I, I'm a busy dude. I don't watch a lot of TV. Word. I'm always out there trying to trying to write stuff for TV or be on TV. <laughs> so right. I don't I have a lot of time to watch TV. Right. Uh, people, a lot of people are upset with it. The only thing I would say about it is one thing that is missing to me in in this uh, in the whole entertainment is good stories. Good stories. Can we have some awesome stories? What happened to the stories? Right now, to me, Empire is based upon shock value right. as opposed to story. Right. You know? Right. But again, I'm not knocking your hustle. I get it. You want to write the most shocking stuff you can that you can get people to talking about. Hey, that's, that is part of the business. I get that. Is it is it cool for black people right now? I think it would be cool if we had something to, to to balance out that. Being that right now the only show we really really got that's that's like um, a series type thing is Empire. If we had something else right. that was like uh, another another take on Empire, right? You know, right? But then would it be as exciting? Probably not. I don't know. Right. You, you know, at the end of the day, you're in this business to make money. You're in television production to make money. You're not. They're not trying to, to, um, to direct the people on how to live their life. Right. The unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people who watch television, who listen to music, who go to social media, and then that's how they live their life. You're right. But this is entertainment, man. This isn't necessarily how it is. This right. isn't how you should be. Right. But a lot of people, there's a lot of people in this earth who don't have that ability to just decipher what's real and what's not real. That's true. That's so, true. So, you know, there is a bit of responsibility, I feel, that one should take upon themselves. But if they don't take it, hey, man, I, I, you're going you're gonna to see what happens when you don't take responsibility for what you do. Right. You know, it's not, it's not always sweet at the end. It may be sweet in the beginning. You may get a lot of props for putting this shit on TV right now. But at the end of the day, when the legacy is looked upon, I'm really like, oh, yeah, you was the dude who was in the shock value. 
Right. You weren't you weren't writing anything anything real. You right. was writing stuff to make people say, Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, <laughs> oh my you know, it's like, come on, man. Who is Cookie come sleeping on. with this week? Who is yeah, right. who is who is Lucy's right. gonna be with next week? Yeah. And and you're right. right. You that's the, that's the nature of Hollywood in general. And it's just that we don't have much to even it out. I, I agree with that. I can go with that. Um, you know, and and unfortunately, you know, hey, because we are talking about the beast of Hollywood. Right. Listen, man, you could come in there with the most righteous script, with the most finely trained actors, the best writers, the great director, and you could really have something very meaningful and very positive. At the end of the day, if it's not going to make somebody some money, they're not playing with you. Right. Get him out of here. Get his righteous <laughs> ass out of here. Yeah, it's, it's not for you to make philosophical statements about society. It's about right. being able to put the put the advertisers get advertiser right. revenue. <laughs> it's about selling that Coca Cola, man. It's about selling them Chevys, man. I try they to tell people buy. that. I try to tell them. Some people don't even know that's what TV was invented for. Right. You, you see, here's the deal. And someone, they, they had to break it down for me. I used to be, a, I was a writer for this uh, cartoon that never saw the light of day. I wish it would have, but it was called The Big Head People. And this was a project that was uh, produced by, uh, um, um, not Warrington Hudland, but um, his brother. Uh, um, one of the Hudland brothers was the executive producer and a brother by the name of Stefan Dweck. And we had these really great ideas. We were going to do this whole thing with cartoons and everything. And then, bam, we didn't get the chance because of something else that had nothing to do with the show whatsoever. Right. But in this process, it was explained to me. You think that television is your favorite show that's interrupted by commercials. <laughs> the reality is television is commercials that's interrupted by your favorite show. Exactly. Exactly. The only reason we have television right now is to sell product. Yep. Period. Yep. Period. Yep. In so fact, when in, you, in you fact, know, Freeze, if, I was up. I, I think I told you offline. I was saying, man, I was up late last night because what I had to do was put together a package so that I can get uh, the right sponsors to my network. And to do that, I have to show them demographics. I have to show them. Who's tuning in already? Exactly. What age brackets? Exactly. The, the, the sex of my audience, the gender of my audience, what topics exactly. and all the programming that's running because they could care right. less about my intention. They yeah. only care about who comes to see it. Who's, who's watching you? That's all they care about. And, and right. And the only reason they care about who's watching so that they can go to their sponsors and say, okay, look, we got males, 18 to, to 35. Okay, so we know that men between the ages of 18 to 35, they, 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 they all buy cars. They like cars. Right. So now we can go to, to Chevrolet and say, hey, look, man, we got your demographic right here. Exactly. Uh, what else do these guys do? Oh, they, they, they like Axe deodorant. Right. Because they're, they're at that age where they're just now discovering women and realizing that if you're fucky, you don't get no, no play. Right. So right. let's sell them anything that, you, you know what I'm saying? We'll sell them the cologne and the, and the deodorant. And what else? Oh, they need gum. They're going to have bad breath. So let's tell them that in order to get the chicks, you, you got to buy this dentine. So then now you got that on your, on your sponsorship. Right. It's all that's the only reason they need you to know your demographic so they know who to sell to. Who are they selling to? If they don't know that, you can't make no money. You understand? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Man, um I like I mean, I'm so glad there's somebody else saying it besides me. These the, the my I, you know People doubt it, I guess, because it's coming from me. I don't know. Maybe they believe me. I don't know. But just to hear you echo it, you don't know. You are echoing exactly what I said just last week on this subject. It's the truth. And I never met you before. This is my first time meeting him. I did not bribe this man. This man speaking from, <laughs> from his experience in Hollywood, being a player, being on shows, being a part of the machine himself. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you, Freeze, now. Recently on the Sway on Sway's show, my man Sway, he interviewed right. Kevin Hart, 
And Kevin Hart wow. actually responded to some negative talk from Mike Epps and from Ari Spears about how his material is sourced. And he was right. saying, now the allegations is that Kevin Hart got these guys that work for him, his brothers, his, his homies, his crew, sitting in comedy clubs, right. grabbing material. In your right. experience, is that something that actually happens in the comedy field? Are people still in jokes to that extent that, you, uh, well, Kevin Hart denied it, of course, but in your experience, right. is that something you got to look out for when you're doing material in these comedy Man. clubs? Let me tell you, I could watch, uh, uh, mind you, I've been doing stand-up. This will be my 23rd year. I started November 3rd, 1992. It was right after the riots in L.A., okay? I've been in this game for a long time. Just about, just, a, just about, not all, but just about every comedian that you could put in front of me, I'll tell you where the joke originally came from. Okay, that is a part of this business. And I'm going to be honest with you, I had a hard time with that because I came into comedy from hip hop. Yeah. Hip hop, you never bite nobody's rhymes. That's, <laughs> that's like, that's the cardinal sin. Right. But in comedy, they do it all the time. I, I, I can, I can, man, and I don't even, I, I don't even want to start naming cats because I'll be here too long. <laughs> a lot of these dudes lean and bite and, and sample other comedians. That's how they get on. They're not that funny. I'm telling you all, they're not that funny. Mm -hmm. But, but what I like about Kevin Hart is he, he kept it real, man. You're not going to be at the level of Kevin Hart unless you have a council of people assisting you. True. And he gave props to that council. He said, yeah, I got a lot of people that helped me. And, and, and that's real. That's real. Now, there's a lot of guys out there that got a lot of people that help them, but they don't want to give them the light. Uh, they don't. They want to act like they, they're not. That they, they, I thought of this all on my own. Right. That's a damn lie. Right. Somebody helped. People helped me. I bounce jokes off of other comedians with them, though. I don't do it behind their back. And, and me personally, if somebody's talking about something and I'm talking about that as well, I like to leave it alone. I don't want that. As oh, uh, so and so talking about uh, babies, mamas. Well, I don't want to talk about that. Right. That's just me personally. Right. But I understand that there are people that say hey, you got to have a baby's mama joke. <laughs> Let me take this guy. Nobody knows him. I'll take it, and then they'll think that I made it up. And then when that guy says it, they're gonna think he stole it from me. <laughs> There's a lot of people in this business that do that. Yep. You know, and um, it, it's it's a it's shit. Harry Spears, Mike Epps, come on now. Keep it real, fellas. Do you write your jokes, fellas? See, come on, man. See, see. Don't don't get me started. <laughs> Knocking Kevin Hart. I get that dude a lot of props, man. A lot of props. Because he does he does have a team of writers and he takes good care of them. Right. He pays them well. He put Hell, them I in position. Bread. My understanding is that he put them in a position that they can eat without him. Right, right, and that see, that's the beauty of it, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people in this game that just want to eat off of you. They don't want you to go out here and be in a position to where you can eat without them. Yep. You know that's that that's the Hollywood game. Yep. It's like I want you to I want you to eat, but I only want you to eat from me. I'm going to pay you, and you're not going to eat from nowhere else. Anything else that comes along, I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a thumb on you and keep you from growing. He doesn't do that. He gives them light. He gives them shine. And that's what it's about. I, I take a look at my man Charlie Murphy. I toured this country with Charlie Murphy for eight years. We we toured the world. And one thing I always appreciate about him is is he was always he he, he never tried to keep a thumb on me. He never tried to to block anything that I was doing on my own. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I mean, shit, Eddie Griffin, that was another guy who I started. Mm -hmm. I saw Eddie Griffin the very first time. He saw me the very first time I ever did stand up and made me his opening act on the, on the spot. Wow. And I wrote a lot of jokes for him and he always, he paid me and he kept it, he kept it going. He's like, look, man, I'm, I'm, I'm paying you for this now. So you can't say it no more. 
Right. Well, that's no problem because you paid for it. So I can't knock that. Right. Thank you, man. Here's right. some more. Right. Exactly. But when a guy doesn't want to pay you, a guy just wants to act like, oh, I came <laughs> up with better on my own. That's that's a lie. That's a lie. Right. So I give Kevin Hart big props for standing his ground with those dudes. Mike Epps, I like Mike Epps. Ari Spears, I like Ari Spears. But I'm just not down with guys knocking other dudes who are on top, man. Leave that alone. Don't knock the brother, man. Give him props. Support him, man. And, you know, the kids, man, a lot of these kids who are, who are social media savvy, you got, the, you got the goods for social media, but when it comes to being on that stage, right. you're lacking there. Right. Because they don't, you know what I'm saying? Right. I didn't get as funny as I am overnight. It took it took a lot of a lot of stage time, a mm-hmm. lot of stage time. We're talking, man. We're talking thousands and thousands of hours of me actually performing stand up. You know, work and in the room, it, right? It, work in the rooms, mm-hmm. working this craft because this is a craft. Right. You don't just know it automatically. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you gotta. It's trial and error. There are so many ways to go about succeeding in this business. And there's just as many ways as failing. So you got to figure those two out. And the only way to do it is on stage. So while I was doing all of this, there was somebody that was barely doing the stage time, but they were being very skilled in social media. Well, the guy who's skilled with social media is the guy who's getting a check today. Right, right. So that's why I'm that's broke right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, wow, man. Freeze, freeze, man. All I can say, man, it's been a great conversation, man. I need to know where you are, what you got going on, and what can we promote for you? Okay, what you can promote for me is right now I'm doing this thing called the Baggers Collective. And the Baggers Collective is a is a show that, that uh it's a it's a it's a, a traveling show. And it's uh now I don't know what they call it in DC. In New York, they call it snapping. In Chicago, I believe they call it jonesing. <laughs> but it's the dozens. Basically, it's the dozens. Yeah, we call it okay. joning. Joning. Okay, jones. Now, in LA, we call it bagging. Okay. And it's um, it's what the Baggers Collective is. Myself, AJ Johnson. If you remember him, I do. It's Ezel from Friday. Right. Right. AJ Johnson is a member member of the Baggers Collective. I also got my man Jeff Brown. I also got uh, Zoe Williams. And uh, also my man Cisco, who's a very funny uh, Mexican comedian. That, that he, he, man, he has bags that are half in English and half in Spanish. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You said Zoe Williams is telling jokes? Oh, let me tell you something about Zoe Williams. See, I grew up with Zoe Williams. Okay. I grew up with Zoe Williams, and Zoe is a one hundred percent dude. He's yeah, he's, no he's doubt, very no logical. doubt. He's very well read. Yeah, he's, he's all of that. But the one thing that people don't know about <laughs> Zoe is that he can bag. What? Zoe is hilarious. <laughs> he was a guy. Put it this way: Zoe can bag so good that out of our whole clique of of people, he was one guy that I never picked with. I never messed with him. I always made sure he was on my team because he can shut the room down quickly. This his he's he is and I'm telling him I tell him all the time, so I know you got your whole little persona that you work in. Right. But when are you gonna let people know how funny you are, man? Right. And right. his thing is he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And he came through this last Tuesday and got on the Baggers Collective with us. And he shut a couple of cats down. You know what? I think I saw you tweet that. Yeah, man. Yeah, you tweeted that. And I was like, what? Zoe, I thought you were joking, man. Uh Uh-huh. He can handle his. So let me get this right. So on the 5150 show, Coy's up there playing. Now, Coy's being Coy. You mean Zoe can really hang if he wanted to, but he kind of fall back and do his intellectual thing. I guess you know. But he got levels. He got levels to it. Yeah, he's he. That's his position on that show. He's the intellectual guy. That's his. That's the angle he's working. Uh, but I'm telling you, he has gears. He has gears. He can shift gears to be just as funny as Corey. Maybe not just as funny as Corey, because Corey, I give him 
crazy props. Right, that's, right, right. That's a comedian <laughs> friend of mine. And, right. you know, I'm always going to go with the comedian over the novice. <laughs> but, right. but, so, I, I put it this way. So, we'll, we'll be able to he- hold his head high in the contest of funny with Corey Hope. That's what's he up. He may not dominate, but he would not be shamed. He mm-hmm. will not have to walk with his tail between his legs. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be able to hold his head high. Wow. And that's real. That is real. Wow. But look, well, man. So the back, and, and look, the Baggers Collective isn't just for comedians either. If you're a truck driver <laughs> and you can, and you, and you got bags or you might be a construction worker and you keep everybody at the work site laughing right. or talking about somebody's mama or maybe you're a woman that works in the cafeteria and you got everybody in the back kitchen <laughs> laughing. By the way you describe somebody's head, right. the Baggers Collective is for you. You know, it's, you, it's it's for anybody. You just you just made me picture right these movies I've seen where it'd be somebody like a Fight Club, and anybody could join exactly. Fight Club. Like anybody could come up and try to fight the the champion. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. <laughs> and that's why we say on the Baggers Collective. If you notice, whenever we tweet it for our shows, it's a like, Hecklers are welcome. Wow. Bring your heckling ass down here. We got <laughs> you for you, baby. We're going to put you on stage and put you in front of the mic and put you with other like-minded people and see how you how you fare against them. Right. You understand? Right. And this is, and, and the reason we're doing this, number one, it's fun. And, and, and I That's feel it. that so many people are so sensitive to words. You know, people get crushed by something someone says about them. That's wrong, man. You shouldn't be crushed by someone else, by what somebody has to say about you. (laughs) Man, fuck them. (laughs) You know? I'm not with all of this. Everybody's, oh, the bullies. The bullies said this and the bullies said that. Well, what did you say back to them? (laughs) I went and told on them. Man, get out of here with that. (laughs) Get out of here. Your grandmother told you way back in the day, sticks and stones and breaking bones, the words shall never hurt you. What happened to that, man? People get crumbled by words, man. These are words which are nothing but sounds. You know, <laughs> you can't let a sound define who you are. You can't let a word crumble you. You gotta have the words to throw back to get cats up off you. When I was a kid, I was a fat kid. I was a little fat. You know, I, I wasn't good at basketball. I was too slow for football. I didn't like playing center. You know, I always put the fat kid in center. Right. You know. Right. I didn't like him for that. So what I did do though is stand on the sidelines and make everybody laugh. Mm-hmm. So this is that's what the Baggers Collective is. It's a chance for people to come out and say and get talked about and talk about people and at the end of the day everyone shakes hands and we laugh about it because it's just words, man. It, it, none of these words should be able to define who you are. <laughs> Jeff Brown be cutting them up, man. Oh man, Jeff Brown. <laughs> Jeff Brown, what is Jeff Brown? Jeff Brown, he said something. He got me. Jeff Brown, uh, I was I was tearing Jeff Brown up, and he said one day, I think he said my mother looked like somebody's twin brother. <laughs> and it, you know that's not a right, really right. heavy bag, but it was at this the timing he said it. Right. It was like you know you going in for the kill. And then the victim reached up with the knife and killed me before I was able to finish him off, you know? <laughs> and that's the thing, man. Bag, bagging is an art form, man. And we, we just, you know, it's, it's, another, it's another form of comedy, man. Right, right. And we, we want people, this is more audience participation. And we're going to have it up online. You'll be able to watch it on the app for free. Okay. So we, we recorded this last show that we did. We got two more shows coming up. I'm just locking in the dates now, but they're going to be in the Los Angeles area. Then we're taking it up to Northern California, up to Sacramento area. Okay. And hopefully I'll be able to bring it out there to D.C. or, or other parts of the country. We got, we got to see how it works. Right. If it, if, again, if it don't make money, it don't make sense. That's so how true. do we make money with this so that people will let us come in their club? And they'll be able to say, oh, yes, I sold X amount of drinks, and you're more than welcome to come back. <laughs> exactly. If you're not doing that, you will not be coming back. <laughs> right. We just got to promote it, man. It. Let me know, Let you me know, man, it. if I can help you guys promote it, man. It's all in that promotion, I think. Man, we got to have one in D.C. 
hey, we need to get you on one, Tim. Come on, man. You a, you, the bartender, I know you got crazy, Jones. I know. Hey, man, hey, look, I grew up I grew up like you, bro. I mean, you're going to be... You're going to get sitting in the house crying if you can't hang. Because brothers it. will not get off that ass. If they cutting you That's up, it. you bet you better say something. Hey, man. I, hey, man. And it gets, it gets, it goes, we go in, man. Right. Like, bro, one of the guys, I can't remember who it was, somebody said, hey, man, I'm talking about my mom. My mom passed away. They said, your mom passed away? Well, dig that bitch up. Let's bring her <laughs> out here. God damn. It goes hard. And, and that's the thing, though. It toughens up your skin, man, because yes, at the end of the day, man, you can't fight everybody that's got something right. bad to say about you. Right. You gotta learn how to laugh this stuff off, man, and don't worry about it, man. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. You know? Man, this is this has been a great conversation, Freeze, man. Thank you for making time, man. Thank you for the opportunity man, to you. chop it up with thank you. Thank you. I mean it. Thank you for bringing me on your show. Thank you for doing your show, man. I'm so glad you're not one of these people that, that talks about it. You actually do it. And those are the people that need to be applauded. Don't stop talking about what you're going to do. Do it. Do it, do it, do it, do it. So thank you. I'm on because you did it, man. Thank you. No doubt, man. Look, guys, you need to go check out Freeze Love. Hit him up on Twitter at Freeze Love Comedy. That's F-R-E-E-Z-L-U-V Comedy. Also, That's what right. I'm going to do is I'm going to link up in the description box you go down and look, you'll see all his links to everything he's got on the internet, as well as information about the Baggers Collective, what he has out there, all right? So say goodnight to the bad guy. Go on. Hey, I'm 49. So when you talk about hip hop, Right. You're talking about my music, man. This is the music that I first discovered when I was 12 years old, and it changed my life. When I heard Rapper's Delight, it changed my life. Right. I had never had a song that I had to listen to over and over and over and try to <laughs> say all the words and write down the words right. that I was saying so I can remember. No, no, no other music had did that for me. None. None. So... As far as, you know, when it when it comes time, you know, people say hip hop is over, hip hop is dead. Uh not for me it isn't. It's 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 not gonna end till till I end. Right. It's always gonna be something new. And I'm not saying I'm the end all be all of hip hop. I'm just saying as a listener, as an as a participant, we write the rules, man. We right. write the rules. Right. And it ain't over and it ain't done till we say it's done. Exactly. I'm glad you mentioned hip hop because I got a. I'm in a rap group. I got a rap group. Well, go, go, ahead, go ahead, and plug away. Tell me what's up. Man, my rap group is called the Killer Wells. K I L L A H W H A L E Z. And you can check us out online. We got a song on YouTube called "Slap That Seal, Let Your Blow Hole Blow." <laughs> <laughs> see, the killer whale. What we rap, we rap from the perspective of orcas. <laughs> That's right. We rap from the perspective of orcas, and all of our rap, all of our raps are about sustainability and ecology, and bringing awareness to the ills that humans are placing upon the earth. Wow. You understand? Wow. It says killer whales are the top of the food chain of all mammals. It's their position to speak on it. So that's what we do. Hey, with Freeze, you're, oh, freeze you're not joking. Tea. Freeze, hold up, Freeze. You're not joking with me. You're serious, aren't you? I'm not joking. I'm serious, man. The music is bumping. You can't deny it. You can't deny it. I mean, as an artist, how much, how much stuff are we going to talk about before we're talking about the same thing? One of the things I've always tried to do as an artist is do something that hasn't been done before, number one, right. the original. Right. Number two, be timeless. You can't put a date on it. Right. You, you, it's, it's, it's happening now. It could be happening five years from now. It could be happening 10 years from now. There is no date on it. And number three, blow people's minds, man. Try to, try to do something that, that's going to impact them and make them think. So as an artist, that was that was my goal. I got other MCs together. I mean, dope MCs like my man out of Brooklyn. Big ups to my homeboy Skanks the Rap Martyr. 
with the whole La Casa Nostrum crew, the LCN crew. This is a bona fide 100 percent I'm like, yo, what do you mean Puerto Rican? I ain't no Puerto Rican, what right. you, you know? Right. But I had never been that I'd never been in that situation, you know? Right. So that was new something new to play with and and try to figure out. I had to overcome that. I had to to, you know, fight for my right to being a black man <laughs> with a black voice. So you so know? so you had to fight to prove that you were a black man telling black jokes. Or black Right. Yeah. Right, and, and I've never been in that position before because you know in California, right. if you if you got one eighth blackness, oh, you one hundred percent black in California. They're not playing that. They'll let you know. Right. So I never, you know, and not only me, but other black people knew. They, yeah, Caesar's black. Like, oh, he light skin, but who cares? He's a president. I what? never. I didn't. In New York, there's so many other people. There's that I look like. There's Arabs that I look like. Right. You know, dudes from Morocco that I look like. Dudes from Puerto Rico, uh, from the Dominican Republic, from all these places. Right, and right. these were all people that I had never met. Wow. So, you know, I had to embrace that and and figure out where I fit in, you know? Bro, matter of fact, you've done a masterful job at a freeze. I've seen some of your material where you play various characters from different backgrounds, different nationalities, different races, using that. Well, listen. Sometimes you have to do whatever you gotta do to get the. If they're gonna say you gotta be Dominican, then okay, I'm not gonna argue. I'm gonna get the check. You have to get the money. Some way. Some way. Take, look, take what you got and make it work for you. Take what you got and work with it, man. And I, I'll tell anybody in comedy if you got a big head, man, talk about that big head. Don't be ashamed. There's somebody else out there with the big head that needs to hear you talking about that. Man, you know? I 100% I agree with you, bro. That's why I've I've started the hashtag Team Black. And people are like, Tim, you're going to alienate white people. I said, see, that's your problem. Y'all worry too much about people being offended. I'm a black man. And I, right. I have no qualms with that. I can't hide it. So why not lead with that? Right. And see, that was the thing with me. A lot of people, especially in Hollywood, they're like, hey, man, look, man, everybody thinks you're Latino. You should change your name to, <laughs> to uh, something like, like Frio Amore, you know? <laughs> or you should just tell them you're Spanish. Or you should tell them you're Arab. And I'm not. I'm not Latino. I'm not Arab. And to me, that's disrespectful to, to, to try to act like, something you're not to make everyone else comfortable. Oh, man, bro, hey, look, hey, bro, man. hey, Freeze, man, you know you just walked into dangerous water. That remind me of Carlos Mencia, right? Isn't that the thing they were saying about him? Yes. You need to know where you are, what you got going on, and what can we promote for you? Okay, what you can promote for me is right now I'm doing this thing called the Baggers Collective. And the Baggers Collective is a, is a show is that, that uh, it's a it's a it's a, a traveling show, and it's uh now I don't know what they call it in D.C. In New York they call it snapping, in Chicago I believe they call it jonesing, <laughs> but it's the dozens. Basically, it's the dozens. Yeah, we call it okay. joning, joning. Okay, Jones. Now in L.A. we call it bagging. Okay, and it's um. It's what the Baggers Collective is. Myself, AJ Johnson, if you remember him, I do. is Ezel from Friday. Right. Right. AJ Johnson is a member of, member of the Baggers Collective. I also got my man Jeff Brown. I also got uh, Zoe Williams. And uh, also my man Cisco, who's a very funny uh, Mexican comedian. That, that he, he, man, he has bags that are half in English and half in Spanish. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You said Zoe Williams is telling jokes? Oh, let me tell you something about Zoe Williams. See, I grew up with Zoe Williams. Okay. I grew up with Zoe Williams. And Zoe is a 100% dude. He's, yeah, he's, no he's doubt, very no logical. Doubt. He's very well read. He's, yeah. He's all of that. But the one thing that people don't know about <laughs> Zoe is that he can bag. What? Zoe is hilarious. <laughs> he was a guy. Put it this way. Zoe can bag so good that out of our whole clique of, of people, he was one guy that I never picked with. I never <laughs> messed with him. I always made sure he was on my team. 
because he can shut the room down quickly. This his he's he is and I'm telling him I tell him all the time, so I know you got your whole little persona that you work in. Right. But when are you gonna let people know how funny you are, man? Right. And right. his thing is he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And he came through this last Tuesday and got on the Baggers Collective with us and he shut a couple of cats down. You know what? I think you I know? saw you tweet that. Yeah, man. Yeah, he you tweeted busy. that and I was like, What? Zo, I thought sure you were did. joking, man. Uh-huh. He can handle his. So let me get he this right. So on the 5150 show, Coy's up there playing. Now, Coy's being Coy. You mean Zoe could right. really hang if he wanted to, but he kind of he kind of fall back and do his intellectual thing. I guess you know. But he got he levels. Plays. He got levels yeah. to it. Yeah, he's, he, that's his position on that show. He's the intellectual guy. That's, his, that's the angle uh, he's working. But I'm telling you, he has gears. He has gears. He can shift gears to be just as funny as Corey. Maybe not just as funny. Can okay, laugh a little bit? We gonna get justice for him one way or the other. Now look, this is the thing, man. For all you racists and bigots, dumbasses, and self haters, because there's a lot of them too. Jesse Lee Peterson types, Gerardo Rivera hating black people. There was nothing that justifies shooting this man in the back as he fled. Nothing. Zero. So I'm sorry. My opinion before I saw the video hasn't changed one centimeter since seeing this video. I'm the same man. I feel the same way I felt. I have not changed. You understand? Now, the fact that you somehow believe that human beings should be under the foot of police and police should be able to do whatever they want to do. Do whatever you want to do to me, boss. Just go ahead and do it. Please go ahead and put your boot up, your boot up my ass if you want. Go ahead and choke me out and kill me. That's because you think that's fair and you think that's right. Doesn't mean I do. And I had the same opinion whether Mr. Scott was white, Asian, Latino, Swahilian, uh, uh, Filipino, French, I don't care. Muslim, I don't care. Christian, atheist, I do not care. I do not care what Mr. Scott happens to be. He happens to be a black man. He happened to owe some money. He wasn't even out, listen, listen. He owed child support. You know how people are owed child support who are running from cops? That means we can shoot them all in the back. Come on, man. Look, I don't even want, you know what? If you're too stupid, if you're so stupid and brain damaged, that you believe that that officer Slager is justified in what he did, man, I don't even want to talk to you no more. You, you, are, you, are, wasted, you are wasted saliva and oxygen. I should not waste time talking to you. You are beyond reaching. I'm through with you. You're too dumb. Go live under a rock. Go somewhere. Just go. Just go over there. And leave me alone. Go over there. Wait for me. All right. Like I said, I got a great show coming up for you guys, man. It's the Boss Two Podcast. Thank you for being here. Let's get to that part of the show, man. If I hurt somebody, damn sellout bastards. This Friday, folks, welcome to the Boss 2 Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Black. We got interviews, we got up to the minute news, we got entertainment, we got it all. The Boss 2 Podcast, Team Black. Why can't we pick our own colors? No way, no way. Try the ones that doesn't work. You get four guys, all fighting over who's going to be Mr. Black. trained actors, the best writers, the great director, and you could really have something very meaningful and very positive. At the end of the day, if it's not going to make somebody some money, they're not playing with you. Right. Get him out of here. Get his righteous <laughs> ass out of here. Yeah. Here, it's, it's not for you to make philosophical statements about society. It's about right. being able to put the, put the advertisers, get advertiser right. revenue. <laughs> it's about selling that Coca-Cola, man. It's about selling them Chevys, man. I try they to tell people buy. that. I try to tell them. Some people don't even know. That's what TV was invented for. Right. You, you see, here's the deal. And someone, they, they had to break it down for me. I used to be, a, I was a writer for this uh, cartoon that never saw the light of day. I wish it would have. 
but it was called the Big Head People. And this was a project that was uh, produced by uh, um, um, not Warrington Hudland, but um, his brother. Uh, um, one of the Hudland brothers was the executive producer and a brother by the name of Stefan Dweck. And we had these really great ideas. We were going to do this whole thing with cartoons and everything. And then, bam, we didn't get the chance because of something else that had nothing to do with the show whatsoever. Right. But in this process, it was explained to me. You think that television is your favorite show that's interrupted by commercials. <laughs> the reality is television is commercials that's interrupted by your favorite show. Exactly. Exactly. The only reason we have television right now is to sell product. Yep. Period. Yep. Period. Yep. In so fact, when in, you, in you fact, know, Freeze, if, I was up. I, I think I told you offline. I was saying, man, I was up late last night because what I had to do was put together a package so that I can get uh, the right sponsors to my network. And to do that, I have to show them demographics. I have to show them who's tuning in already, exactly. what age brackets, exactly. the, the, the sex of my audience, the gender of my audience, what topics exactly. and all the programming that's running because they could care right. less about my intention. They only yeah. care about who comes to see it. Who's, who's watching you? That's all they care about. And and right, and the only reason they care about who's watching so that they can go to their sponsors and say, okay, look, we got males 18 to, to 35. Okay, so we know that men between the ages of 18 to 35, they, 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 they all buy cars. They like cars. Right. So now we can go to, to Chevrolet and say, hey, look, man, we got your demographic right here. Exactly. Uh, what else do these guys do? Oh, they, they, they like Axe deodorant. Right. Because they're they're at that age where they're just now discovering women and real brother, man. Give them props. Support him, man. And you know, the kids, man, a lot of these kids who are who are social media savvy, you got the you got the goods for social media, but when it comes to being on that stage, right. you're lacking there. Right. Because they don't you know what I'm saying? Right. I didn't get as funny as I am overnight. It took it took a lot of a lot of stage time, a mm. lot of stage time. We're talking, man. We're talking thousands and thousands of hours of me actually performing stand up. You know, working and the room, it, right? It, working the rooms, working mm. this craft because this is a craft. Right. You don't just know it automatically. Mm -hmm. You gotta you gotta. It's trial and error. There are so many ways to go about succeeding in this business. And there's just as many ways as failing. So you got to figure those two out. And the only way to do it is on stage. So while I was doing all of this, there was somebody that was barely doing the stage time, but they were being very skilled in social media. Well, the guy who's skilled with social media is the guy who's getting a check today. Right, right. So that's why I'm that's broke right, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, wow, man. Freeze, freeze, man. All I can say, man, it's been a great conversation, man. I need to know where you are, what you got going on, and what can we promote for you? Okay, what you can promote for me is right now I'm doing this thing called the Baggers Collective. And the Baggers Collective is a is a show that that uh it's a it's a it's a, a traveling show. And it's uh now I don't know what they call it in DC. In New York, they call it snapping. In Chicago, I believe they call it jonesing. <laughs> but it's the dozens. Basically, it's the dozens. Yeah, we call it okay. joning. Joning. Okay, Jones. Now, in LA, we call it bagging. Okay. And it's um, it's what the Baggers Collective is. Myself, AJ Johnson. If you remember him, I do. As Ezel from Friday. Right. Right. AJ Johnson is a member of, member of the Baggers Collective. I also got my man Jeff Brown. I also got uh, Zoe Williams. And uh, also my man Cisco, who's a very funny uh, Mexican comedian. That, that he, he, man, he has bags that are half in English and half in Spanish. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You said Zoe Williams is telling jokes? Oh, let me tell you something about Zoe Williams. See, I grew up with Zoe Williams. Okay. I grew up with Zoe Williams. 
And Zoe is a 100% dude. He's, yeah, he's, no he's doubt, very no logical. Doubt. He's very well read. He, yeah. He, he's all of that. But the one thing that people don't know about <laughs> Zoe, the most righteous script with the most finely trained actors, the best writers, the great director. And you could really have something very meaningful and very positive. At the end of the day, if it's not going to make somebody some money, they're not playing with you. Right. Get him out of here. Get his righteous <laughs> ass out of here. Yeah. Him, it's, it's not for you to make philosophical statements about society. It's about right. being able to put the, put the advertisers, get advertiser right. revenue. <laughs> it's about selling that Coca-Cola, man. It's about selling them Chevys, man. I try they to tell people, people that. I try to tell them. Some people don't even know. That's what TV was invented for. Right. You, you see, here's the deal. And someone, they, they had to break it down for me. I used to be, a, I was a writer for this uh, cartoon that never saw the light of day. I wish it would have. But it was called The Big Head People. And this was a project that was uh, produced by, uh, um, um, not Warrington Hudland, but um, his brother, uh, um, one of the Hudland brothers was the executive producer and a brother by the name of Stefan Dweck. And we had these really great ideas. We were going to do this whole thing with cartoons and everything. And then, bam, we didn't get the chance because of something else that had nothing to do with the show whatsoever. Right. But in this process, it was explained to me. You think that television is your favorite show that's interrupted by commercials. <laughs> the reality is, television is commercials that's interrupted by your favorite show. Exactly. exactly. The only reason we have television right now is to sell product. Yep. Period. Yep. Period. Yep. In so fact, when in, you, in you fact, know, Freeze, if, I was up, I, I think I told you offline, I was saying, man, I was up late last night because what I had to do was put together a package so that I can get uh, the right sponsors to my network. And to do that, I have to show them demographics. I have to show them who's tuning in already, exactly. what age brackets, exactly. the, the, the sex of my audience, the gender of my audience, what topics exactly. and all the programming that's running. Because they could care right. less about my intention. They only yeah. care about who comes to see it. Who's, who's watching you? That's all they care about. And, and right. And the only reason they care about who's watching so that they can go to their sponsors and say, okay, look, we got males 18 to, to 35. Okay, so we know that men between the ages of 18 to 35, they, 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 they all buy cars. They like cars. Right. So now we can go to... To Chevrolet and say, "Hey, look, man, we got your demographic right here. Exactly. Uh, what else do these guys do? Oh, they 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 like axe deodorant, right? Because they're they're at that age. I would say, like, man, I'm 40, and you've been in the game so long, man. You you one of the guys I looked at, man, when I even considered getting into comedy, bro. Much respect and homage to my man Freeze Love. Man, thank you so so much, brother. I mean, and it's. Man. Hey, any, and, and I'll tell anybody, I'm glad you, you got into comedy instead of sitting around wishing you was in comedy. <laughs> you know? Nah, like Freeze, so Freeze, I ain't, look, Freeze, I'm not in comedy like you, bro. I got I, I have comedy traces, but I'm not a comedian, bro. Nah, I'm going to leave but, that but, to you. <laughs> but, but, but let me tell you, though, you're, you, are, you are in the comedy family because you've taken action with your funny. And that's what it's about. You don't have to always be a comedian. There's a lot of people that are really funny, but they don't do anything. You got to do something. Become a writer. <laughs> Become a radio for anything. If you're funny, you're funny for a reason, man. Yeah, you know, matter of fact, when you brought up writing, I noticed, Freeze, after doing a little research, man, that you, you have some writer credits as well as acting credits as well as stand-up credits. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You, you, I mean, if you're going to, one thing about being a stand up comedian, you got to eat. And paying, you know, being on stage isn't always going to bring in the bread. Right. So you got to diversify, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I was in the game, I was doing stand up for about 10 years and was a writer, but didn't realize I was a writer. And then someone pointed out to me, they said, well, you're a stand up comedian. Of course you're a writer. You write your own material, right? I said, yeah. 
Right. They said, well, you're a remitter. You just have to know how to, how to bring it into light. You know, just for anybody who doesn't know, Freeze, please tell people where you from, man. Where where'd you, where were you born and where where'd you originate? I am a West Coast kid, 100% born and raised in Los Angeles, California. West Coast and kid. West Coast, West Side. West Side. <laughs> and um, I lived when I was, you know, kind of, I had about 10 years under my belt as far as comedy goes, stand up. In Los Angeles, in the Hollywood area, the Comedy Store, the, the Improv, the Live Factory, the Ha Ha Cafe, all these places in LA. And I had, um, you know, I was bored. I wasn't, it wasn't challenged anymore. It was like, you know, I had to, to see what else comedy had to offer. So after 10 years in the game, I moved to New York. Didn't know anybody in New York. I had one cousin from Chicago that lived in New York. Wow. And I ended up staying with him and a couple of friends, other comedian friends that I knew started and, you know, plugging me with the with the rooms and the, the whole New York crowd. I said, <laughs> that's it. This has never happened to me in L.A. I'm, I got to figure out a way to stay here. That's so what's up. I did. I, 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 you know, made a few ends, you know, put, put twos and fuels together and ended up staying out there. Got in a uh, apartment with my cousin who was from Chicago. Right. And next thing you know, I was, I was on the circuit. I was I was hitting clubs, and and it was just it was like a breath of fresh air, because right. you know as comedians we feed off of our surroundings. Right. And the thing with Los Angeles was, it was I had been there, did that. I was from LA. I'm, I knew everything about LA. It's not that I didn't like LA. I love LA. Right. But I was burnt out on LA as far as comedy goes. Gotcha. So. In order to make it fresh and new for me again, it took me going to New York. And that was, you know, I got, I'm not going to lie, man. I got, I had to work. I had to work. New York is uh, the biggest thing I had to work for is people, they was like, hey, why is this Puerto Rican dude trying to sound like a black man? <laughs> you know? Right. And right. I'm like, you know, what do you mean Puerto Rican? I ain't no Puerto Rican. What right. You know? Right. But I had never been. I'd never been in that situation, you know? Right. So that was new, something new to play with and and try to figure out. I had to overcome that. I had to, to you know, fight for my right to be in a black man <laughs> with a black voice. So you so, so you had to fight to prove that you were a black man telling black jokes or black... Right. Yeah. Right. And, and I've never <laughs> been in that position before because, you know, in California, right. if you... If you got one eighth blackness, oh, you one hundred percent black in California. They're not playing that. They'll let you know. Right. So I never, you know, and not only me, but other black people knew. They, yeah, freeze is black. Oh, he likes him, but who cares? He's a brother. <laughs> I never. I didn't. In New York, there's so many other people. There's that I look like. There's Arabs that I look like. Right. You know, dudes from Morocco that I look like. Dudes from Puerto Rico, uh, from the Dominican Republic, from. All these places, right, and right. these were all people that I had never met. Wow! So you know, I had to embrace that and and figure out where I fit in. You know, bro. Matter of fact, you've done a masterful job at a freeze. I've seen some of your material where you play various characters from different backgrounds, different lo nationalities, different races, using that. Well, listen, sometimes you have to do whatever you got to do to get the... If they're going to say you got to be Dominican, then okay, I'm not going to argue. I'm going to get the check. You have to get the money. Some way. Some way. Take, look, take what you got and make it work for you. Take what you got and work with it, man. And I, I'll tell anybody in comedy, if you got a big head, man, talk about that big head. Don't be how you fare against them. Right. You understand? Right. And this is, and, and the reason we're doing this, number one, it's fun. It, and and I, I feel it. that so many people are so sensitive to words. You know, people get crushed by something someone says about them. That's wrong, man. You, right. you shouldn't be crushed by someone else, by what somebody has to say about you. <laughs> man, fuck them. <laughs> you know? Right. I'm not with all of this. Everybody's, oh, the bullies. The bully said this and the bully said that. Well, what did you say back to him? I went and told on him. Man, get out of here with that. Get out of here. Your grandmother told you way back in the day, sticks and stones and breaking bones, the words shall never hurt you. Never hurt what you. happened to that, man? People get crumbled by 
are words, man. These are words which are nothing but sounds. You know? <laughs> you can't let a sound define who you are. You can't let a word crumble you. You gotta have the words to throw back to get cats up off you. When I was a kid, I was a fat kid. I was a little fat. You know, I, I wasn't good at basketball. I was too slow for football. I didn't like playing center. You know, I always put the fat kid in center. Right. You know, right. I didn't like him for that. So what I did do, though, is stand on the sidelines and make everybody laugh. Mm -hmm. So this is, that's what the Baggers Collective is. It's a chance for people to come out and say and get talked about and talk about people. And at the end of the day, everyone shakes hands and we laugh about it because it's just words, man. It, it, none of these words should be able to define who you are. <laughs> Jeff Brown be cutting them up, man. Oh, man, Jeff Brown. <laughs> Jeff Brown. What is Jeff Brown? Jeff Brown, he said something. He got me. Jeff Brown, uh, I, was, I was tearing Jeff Brown up, and he said one bag. I think he said my mother looked like somebody's twin brother. <laughs> and it, you know, that's not a right, really right. heavy bag, but it was at this, the timing he said it. Right. It was like, you know, you're going in for the kill, and then the victim reached up with the knife and killed me before I was able to finish him off, you know? Right. And that's the thing, man. Bag, bagging is an art form, man. And we, we just, you know, it's, it's, another, it's another form of comedy, man. Right, right. And we, we want people, this is more audience participation. And we're going to have it up online. You'll be able to watch it on the app for free. Okay. So we, we recorded this last show that we did. We got two more shows coming up. I'm just locking in the dates now, but they're going to be in the Los Angeles area. Then we're taking it up to Northern California, up to Sacramento area. Okay. And hopefully I'll be able to bring it out there to D.C. or, or other parts of the country. We got, we got to see how it works. Right. If it, if, again, if it don't make money... It Who's that hashtag? Team Black. All right. Now, you ready for the interview with my man Freeze Love, actor, writer, comedian? Hire him. Hook him up. The man knows his stuff. We talk about empire. We talk about Hollywood influences. We talk about drugs. We talk about, oh man, c comedy. We talk about joke stealing and joke stealers. We talk about Carlos Men Stealer or Carlos Joke Stealer. We talk. <laughs> <laughs> that ain't even right because my man don't even go in too much. But you know what? You'll hear for yourself about Carlos Messia. Also, we're going to talk about Kevin Hart, Mike Epps, Eric Spears. We even talk about ecology. We talk about a new style of hip-hop that my man freezes undertaking. And, and yo, we talk about the Baggers Collective which is a comedy tour my man freezes putting together with my man A.J. Johnson. Eat hell! Eat hell! From Friday. <laughs> anyway, guys, check out the interview. It's hot. I'm, I'm glad you could take time out your schedule, man. You, I've been wanting to get you on here for a minute, man. I'm a true fan of your work. I, I, you know, and I think you're one of the comedians, man, that I would say, like, man, I'm 40. And you've been in the game so long, man. You, you one of the guys I looked at, man, when I even considered getting into comedy, bro. Much respect and homage to my man Freeze Love. Man, thank you so so much, brother. I mean it, and it's man. Hey, any and, and I'll tell anybody, I'm glad you you got into comedy instead of sitting around wishing you was in comedy. <laughs> you know, no, nah, like freeze, so freeze I ain't, look, freeze. I'm not in comedy like you, bro. I got I I have comedy traces, but I'm not a comedian, bro. Nah, I'm gonna but, leave that but, to you. But, but, <laughs> but, but let me tell you though. You're, you are you are in the comedy family because you've taken action with your funny, and that's what it's about. You don't have to always be a comedian. There's a lot of people that are really funny, but they don't do anything. You got to do something. Become a writer. <laughs> Become a radio for anything. If you're funny, you're funny for a reason, man. Yeah, you know, matter of fact, when you brought up writing, I noticed, Freeze, after doing a little research, man, that you, you have some writer credits as well as acting credits as well as stand up credits yeah yes sir yes sir you, you i mean if you're gonna one thing about being a stand-up comedian you gotta eat and paying you know being on stage isn't always gonna bring in the bread right so you gotta diversify <laughs> you know <laughs> and i'll be honest 
honest with you, I was in the game. I was doing stand up for about ten years, and was a writer, but didn't realize I was a writer. And then someone pointed out to me. They said, "Well, you're a stand up comedian. Of course, you're a writer. You write your own to to thirty five. Okay, so we know that men between the ages of eighteen to thirty five, they 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 all buy cars. They like cars. Right. So now we can go to." to Chevrolet and say, hey, look, man, we got your demographic right here. Exactly. Uh, what else do these guys do? Oh, they, they, they like Axe deodorant. Right. Because they're, they're at that age where they're just now discovering women and realizing that if you're funky, you don't get no, no play. Right. So right. let's sell them anything <laughs> that, you, you know what I'm saying, we'll sell them the cologne and the, and the deodorant. And what else? Oh, they need gum. They're going to have bad breath. So let's tell them that in order to get the chicks you, you got to buy this dentine, so then now you got that on your on your sponsorship. Right. It's all that's the only reason they need you to know your demographic, so they know who to sell to. Who are they selling to? If they don't know that, you can't make no money. You understand? Absolutely, man. Absolutely, man. Um, I like. I mean, I'm so glad there's somebody else saying it besides me. These the, the my you know. People doubt it, I guess, because it's coming from me. I don't know. Maybe they believe me. I don't know. But just to hear you echo it, you don't know. You are echoing exactly what I said just last week on this subject. It's the truth. And I never met you before. This is my first time meeting him. I did not bribe this man. This man speaking from, <laughs> from his experience in Hollywood, being a player, being on shows, being a part of the machine himself. Now, let me ask you. Let me ask you, Freeze, now. Recently on the Sway on Sway's show, my man Sway, he interviewed right. Kevin Hart. And Kevin Hart wow. actually responded to some negative talk from Mike Epps and from Ari Spears about how his material is sourced. And he was right. saying, now the allegations is that Kevin Hart got these guys that work for him, his brothers, his, his homies, his crew, sitting in comedy clubs right. grabbing material. In your experience, is that something that actually happens in the comedy field? Are people still in jokes to that extent that, you, well, Kevin Hart denied it, of course, but in your experience, is that something you got to look out for when you're doing material in these comedy Man, clubs? Let me tell you, I could watch, uh, uh, mind you, I've been doing stand-up, this will be my 23rd year. I started November 3rd, 1992. It was right after the riots in L.A. Okay, I've been in this game for a long time. Just about, just, a, just about, not all, but just about every comedian that you could put in front of me, I'll tell you where the joke originally came from. Wow. Okay, that is a part of this business. And I'm going to be honest with you, I had a hard time with that because I came in aiming. It's good stories, good stories. Can we have some awesome stories? What happened to the stories? Right now, to me, empire is based upon shock value right. as opposed to story. Right. You know? Right. But again, I'm not knocking your hustle. I get it. You want to write the most shocking stuff you can that you can get people to talking about. Hey, that's, that is part of the business. I get that. Is it, is it cool for black people right now? I think it would be cool if we had something to, to, to balance out that. Being that right now, the only show we really, really got that's, that's <laughs> like um, a series type thing is Empire. If we had something else right. that was like uh, another another take on Empire, right? you know? Right. But then would it be as exciting? Probably not. I don't know. Right. You, you know, at the end of the day, you're in this business to make money. You're in television production to make money. You're not. They're not trying to, to, um, to direct the people on how to live their life. Right. The unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people who watch television, who listen to music, who go to social media, and then that's how they live their life. You're right. But this is entertainment, man. This isn't necessarily how it is. This right. isn't how you should be. Right. But a lot of people, there's a lot of people in this earth who don't have that ability to just decipher what's real and what's not real. That's true. That's so, true. So, you know, there is a bit of responsibility, I feel, that one should take upon themselves. But 
if they don't take it, hey man, I, I, you're gonna you're gonna see what happens when you don't take responsibility for what you do. Right. You know, it's not it's not always sweet at the end. It may be sweet in the beginning. You may get a lot of props for putting this shit on TV right now, but at the end of the day, when the legacy is looked upon, I'm really like, oh yeah, you was the dude who was in the shock value. Right. You weren't you weren't writing anything anything real. You right. was writing stuff to make people say, oh, oh my gosh, oh, oh my, you know, it's like, come on, man. Who was Cookie come sleeping on. with this week? Who was, yeah, right. who was, who was Lucy's right. going to be with next week? Yeah, and, and you're right, right. You that's, the, that's the nature of Hollywood in general, and it's just that we don't have much to even, and I, I, I agree with that, I can go with that. Um, you know, and. And unfortunately, you know, hey, because we are talking about the beast of Hollywood. Right. Listen, man, you could come in there with the most righteous script, with the most finely trained actors, the best writers, the great director, and you could really have something very meaningful and very positive. At the end of the day, if it's not going to make somebody some money, they're not 